Hello everyone, hope you are all doing well. I am Vidyashree. Hope you are all preparing well for your TET examinations. In order to aid your preparation, I am here before you to discuss some important points from the chapter Matter in Our Surroundings. Without wasting time, let's directly start with the video. Everything that's present around us in our surrounding is known as matter. So this matter is made up of very small tiny particles and these tiny particles from which the matter is made of are indivisible and these indivisible tiny particles they are known as atoms so i can tell that matter is made up of atoms which are indivisible in nature what is matter so this matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. So what is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and it occupies space. Means that matter has mass and it has volume. So you can list a few examples for matter. It is the pen, pencil, books, air, water, etc. All these are matter because they have mass and they occupy space. Ancient Indian philosophers, they told that matter is made up of pancha tattvas. So these pancha tattvas are air, earth, sky, water and fire. Speaking about the physical nature of matter, matter is made up of particles and the particles of matter are very small in size. If you consider a beaker in which we have water, to this water that is taken in a beaker, now we are adding a spoonful of salt that is taken. So this salt is added into water. After some time, we see that salt is uniformly distributed in the water. So we cannot say salt is separate, water is separate. So from this we can tell that matter is made up of small particles. You can also consider another example. Take a glass of water, add 2 to 3 drops of Dettol into that particular glass. Then you take 2 spoons of this Dettol solution, transfer it into another glass containing water which has same quantity as that of the earlier glass. After adding the two spoons of Dettol solution till you can smell the Dettol from that glass. Again, if you transfer two more spoon of Dettol solution into one more glass, still you can feel the smell. So from this also we can tell that matter is made up of small particles because from the Dettol solution, the particles of Dettol are getting transferred into the other glass so that still we can feel the smell of Dettol upon further dilution. Discussing about the characteristics of these particles of the matter, that the particles of matter have spaces present between them. So in order to consider this again, we can consider this example of adding salt or sugar into water. So that salt will be uniformly distributed in the water after some time. So this is possible because in between water particles, we have space. So these salt molecules or sugar molecules occupy the spaces that is present between the water. That's why we get a uniform solution of water once salt is added. The second characteristic is that the particles of matter are continuously moving. For example, you take water in a transparent glass, add two to three drops of ink into that water that is taken in the glass you see that ink drop which you have added spreads throughout in the water so from this we can tell that particles are moving continuously so this motion of the particle energy is associated with that that energy we call it as kinetic energy so we can tell that particles of matter possess kinetic energy and this kinetic energy depends on temperature so as temperature increases kinetic energy increases it means that as temperature is increased particles can move with higher speed 
Third characteristic is that particles of matter attract each other. In order to explain this characteristic, if you imagine a situation where for a running tap, if you hold your finger, your finger cannot cut the flow of water from the tap. This, this is because particles of water are having a force which is attracting them together. So that's what is the third characteristic, particles of matter attract each other. And this attraction varies from matter to matter. So to brief characteristic of particles of matter are that they have spaces present between them. Particles of matter attract one another and these particles are continuously moving. That is they possess kinetic energy. The next phenomenon that you have to note here is diffusion. It is the phenomenon of intermixing of particles of two different types of matter on their own. So whenever particles of two different types of matter are mixed with one another on their own, that process we call it as diffusion. As temperature increases, diffusion will also increase. Next coming to the states of matter. The states of matter are classified into three states. One is solid state, liquid state and gaseous state. Nowadays along with these three states, we also discuss about the plasma state as well as Bose-Einstein condensate. Now let us discuss what are the difference in the properties are observed with respect to the three states of matter. These three states of matter that we are going to consider is solid, liquid and gases. So we shall see which property and how it varies in solids, liquids as well as gases. So the first property is about shape and volume. So you all know that solids have fixed the shape and volume. Whereas liquids, it do not have fixed the shape, but it has volume. And also you know that the liquids take the shape of the container in which it is placed. Coming to gases, gases neither have definite shape nor volume. Second property is energy. So energy of the particles with respect to solid is lowest. With respect to liquid it is medium and with respect to gas the energy of the particles are highest. Compressibility. So take in case of solid. Say you have a solid block. Can you compress it? Can you change the size and shape of the solid by exerting pressure on it? No, right? So it is difficult to compress that. So compressibility of solid is difficult. Take liquid. For example, if you consider water that is taken in a beaker. Can you change the size of the water that is taken in a beaker by compressing it? To a slight extent it is possible. So I can write it as nearly difficult, not very difficult, nearly difficult. With respect to gas, can you compress gas? Yes, it's easy. So it is easy to compress gas. Next, speaking with respect to arrangement of molecules, with respect to solids, liquids and gas. In case of solid, we observe a regular and orderly arrangement of the particle. With respect to liquid, the arrangement is random and it is little sparsely arranged. With respect to gases, the arrangement of particles is random and they are more sparsely arranged. Means, in case of solid, the space between the particles is very very less whereas with respect to liquids and solid space is available liquid can freely move whereas with respect to freedom of particles in gases they are very free to move speaking about fluidity fluidity means the ability to flow fluidity tells about ability to flow so solids Particles are orderly arranged and space between the particles is very less. So they cannot flow. So that fluidity is we state that it cannot flow. Comes to liquid. In case of liquid, particles are arranged in such a way that there are empty spaces that is present between the particles of liquid. So they can flow. So they flows from higher level to lower level. Now with respect to gases, as I already told you earlier that particles are very free to move. So their fluidity is high that they can move in every direction. Their random movement in every direction is possible for gases. Next coming to the movement of particles with respect to solid the movement is negligible and with respect to liquids it depends on interparticle attraction. What about the force of attraction between the interparticles? Based on that, we can tell whether 
movement of particles are possible in liquid with respect to gases it is free constant and random movement is observed next checking with the interparticle space means spaces that is present between the particles so in case of solid it is very less in between the liquid particles the interspace between the particles is more with respect to gases we observe a large space between the interparticles Speaking about the attraction between the particles that's present in solid, liquid and gases, with respect to solids, we see less space is present between the particles. Therefore, attraction between the particles is maximum and with respect to liquid, the attraction is medium and minimum attraction with respect to the particles of gases. Why? It is because particles can move in any direction so that space between the particles will be more. As a result, attraction will be very minimum. Next, speaking about density, density is maximum with respect to solids, medium with respect to liquids and it's minimum with respect to gases. Next, speaking about rate of diffusion, diffusion means intermixing of particles. So here we are speaking about intermixing of particles in solid, solid, liquid, liquid and gas gases. With respect to solid and solid, diffusion is very negligible. It's because space present between the particles is very, very less. And with respect to liquids, it depends on interparticle attraction. If the attraction between the interparticle is less, diffusion can occur. With respect to gases, diffusion is maximum. It is because particles can move randomly so that space is present between the particles of gas so they can mix together. Just we have discussed about this force of attraction between the particles in case of solid liquids and gases. Note this, this is important. Force of attraction is more in case of solid, medium in case of liquid and it is lesser in case of gases. So if you write in the decreasing order of the force of attraction between the particles, solid is having highest force of attraction between the particles, then we have liquid and the least force of attraction with respect to gases. Also with respect to kinetic energy, kinetic energy means ability of the particles to move. Okay, So here kinetic energy in case of solids is very much lesser, liquid is medium, gases is maximum. Now if I give you honey, then iron and oxygen. And if I ask you to write the force of attraction between the particles, in that order you have to write it. So it means that here honey is liquid, iron is solid and oxygen is gas. So with respect to force of attraction, the order we have is solid more than liquid, which is more than gas. So with respect to honey, iron and oxygen, if I write the order of force of attraction, then Iron is having more force of attraction than honey, which is more than that of oxygen. So this is the order for the force of attraction in case of honey, iron and oxygen. So you are going to arrange this in the order for force of attraction. So same way if it is asked for kinetic energy of the particle. So there, solids have least kinetic energy, liquids have medium, gases have maximum kinetic energy. Remember that kinetic energy of the particles depends on the temperature. As temperature increases, kinetic energy of the particles will also increase. As I already told you, we have the fourth state of matter. It is plasma. So this state consists of super energetic and super excited particles. The particles of plasma state are in the form of ionized gases. For example, the fluorescent tube and neon sign bulb. This consists of particles that are present in the plasma state. So neon sign bulb, it contains neon gas and fluorescent tube contains helium gas or some other gases. Depending on the nature of the gas that is employed, the plasma exhibit different colors at higher temperature. So the color is exhibited only at higher temperature. So with respect to the plasma state, you have to remember that it consists of super energetic and super excited particles. They are in the form of ionized gases. 
For example, you can consider fluorescent tube as well as neon sign bulb. Fluorescent tube consists of helium gas or some other gases whereas neon sign bulb consisting of neon gas. And this plasma glows with special color that is depending on nature of the gas. So usually it is occurring at higher temperature. Glow of sun and stars is because of the plasma that is present in them. The fifth state of matter is the Bose-Einstein condensate. It is in short BEC. So it is formed by cooling of a gas of extremely low density. Gas of low density has to be cooled in order to get Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is the fifth state of matter. Now let us see what density is. This density measures heaviness of a matter. So density is given by the formula mass upon volume. Mass divided by volume gives us density. So this mass per unit volume of the substance is what is called as density. The SA unit of mass is kg and that of volume is meter cube and therefore yes a unit of density is kg per meter cube if you consider the order of density with respect to solids liquids and gases solids have more density than liquids than gases so density of solids is maximum, density of gases is minimum. So same way you might be provided with the examples for solid, liquid and gases. You can ask what is the order of density with respect to those examples that has been given. Always remember that solids are more denser than liquids and gases. In comparison between liquids and gases, liquids are more denser than gases. Speaking about the three states of matter, solids, liquids and gases, these three states are interconvertible means from solid we can get liquid. This liquid can be converted into gas. From gas we can obtain liquid and from liquid we can obtain solid. So solid when heated we get liquid liquids upon heating we get gases and gas when cooled we get liquid liquids upon cooling we get solid so these three states of matter solid liquid and gases we can convert from one state to the other state so that's why matter is interconvertible from one state to another state. This particular chart here is important that it tells about interconversion of matter from one state to another. Solid can be converted into liquid state and this process we call it as fusion. Fusion is the process of conversion of solid into liquid by heating. We convert liquid into gas by heating it and that process we call it as evaporation. By cooling we can convert gas into liquid and this process we call it as condensation. Similarly by cooling we can convert liquid into solid and this process we call it as solidification. Meanwhile from solid to gas we can directly convert it by heating and that process we call it as sublimation. And the reverse process of cooling the gas to obtain solid is also known as sublimation. So the process of converting solid directly into gaseous state. So intermediate liquid state is not observed. That process we call it as sublimation. This is very important. Sublimation is the process of converting solid into gaseous state by heating. Examples you can consider. Camphor. naphthalene, and ammonium chloride, NH4Cl is the formula. So this undergoes 
sublimation means directly it can be converted from solid state to gaseous state also we have one more chemical it's iodine so this is also undergoing sublimation in between liquid state is not observed solid is directly converted into gaseous state so these are all the examples for a sublimate sublimate is the one which is directly converted from solid to gaseous state i already told you that to change matter from one state to other state heat has to be supplied right so how does this temperature change or by supply of heat we can change one matter to the other state say you imagine we have solid form okay ice you can consider different forms of water that we have is ice water and water vapor so ice is in the solid state i'll just write it here ice to water it is converted into water vapor ice is the solid form water is the liquid form water vapor is the gaseous form ice is in the solid state in case of solid state the force of attraction between the particles is more when you supply temperature or when heat is given these particles gain energy and they start to oscillate or they start to vibrate in their position when they start to vibrate the force of attraction between the particles begin to decrease when force of attraction between the particles decreases they start to separate so by this one state of matter can be converted into the other state so that's what is given on increasing the heat particles gain energy and they start vibrating with greater energy as a result kinetic energy of the particles increases and this overcomes the force of attraction so we obtain a new state when solid is getting converted into liquid state that's when ice is melted into water that temperature we call it as melting point so when water is getting converted into water vapor we call it as boiling point so now let us see what is the definition for melting point and boiling point so melting point is the temperature at which solid melts to become liquid solid melts to become liquid at atmospheric pressure so this is important at atmospheric pressure when solid is melted to form liquid we call it as melting point coming to the boiling point now this is the temperature at which liquid starts boiling at the atmospheric pressure so that is known as boiling point and remember that boiling point is a bulk phenomenon so conversion of ice to water is taking place at its melting point and the melting point of ice is 0 degree centigrade 0 degree centigrade and in terms of kelvin it is 273 kelvin so kelvin is the si unit of temperature si unit of temperature is kelvin it is represented by capital letter english alphabet k the other units we have is degree centigrade as well as fahrenheit and these units of temperature are interconvertible to express degree centigrade in terms of kelvin so kelvin is degree centigrade plus 273 when you add 273 to the temperature in degree centigrade we will get the kelvin value of that particular temperature similarly you can convert the temperature in degree centigrade to fahrenheit so that is degree fahrenheit is 9 by 5 degree centigrade plus 32 so using this value you can achieve the conversion of temperature in one unit to the other unit so by using the first expression you can find degree centigrade when kelvin temperature is given so it is kelvin temperature minus 273 that gives us temperature in degree centigrade for example see now if we have 0 degree centigrade and i need to convert to kelvin what i have to do is i have to add plus 273 to that and the temperature is 273 kelvin now if i have 
27 degree centigrade and I need to convert this into Kelvin temperature. So it is 27 plus 273 which is equal to 300 Kelvin. So this is how the conversion can be achieved or vice versa if the temperature is given in Kelvin you need to convert it to degree centigrade. You have to subtract 273 from the Kelvin temperature that is given. So this conversion is important to know that temperature in Kelvin is degree centigrade plus 273. And to obtain temperature in Fahrenheit when it is given in terms of degree centigrade, it's 9 by 5 times the degree centigrade plus 32. Boiling point of water is 100 degree centigrade Or this is 100 plus 273 that is 373 Kelvin. So this is what you have to remember. If it is exact, exactly I need to tell then this 0 degree centigrade it is equal to 273.15 Kelvin. Okay. So in order to simplify and easily tell we denote it as 273. Exact value is 273.15 Kelvin. The two more important terms that you have to note is latent heat of fusion and latent heat of vaporization. So latent heat of fusion is the amount of heat energy that is required to change 1 kg of a solid into liquid at its melting point. Okay, Latent heat is the amount of heat energy that is required to change 1 kg of a solid to liquid at its melting point. Similarly, latent heat of vaporization is the heat energy that is required to change 1 kg of to its vapor at atmospheric pressure means at its boiling point we call it as latent heat of liquid. So here you have to note that this heat that is the latent heat of fusion or vaporization that is usually used to break the force of attraction in between the particles. For example if you consider melting of ice. Say we have a beaker and we have ice cubes that is taken and we are going to melt this by supplying heat. Say we are supplying heat into this with the help of a burner. So heat is supplied. Now this ice is going to melt. If you check temperature with the help of a thermometer, just this is a rough diagram. Okay, thermometer is being inserted and we are going to check the temperature. So as the temperature increases and it reaches 0 degree centigrade, at 0 degree centigrade, the ice starts to melt. Now, once the temperature is reaching 0 degree centigrade, whatever the heat that we supply, temperature is not going to change. Temperature will remain constant for a few seconds. Okay. So, this heat, whatever we supply during this time, that is used to break the force of attraction between the particles. So, that all the ice is getting converted into its liquid state, that is water. So, that heat which is supplied during this short interval of time which is not used to increase the temperature. Instead, it is used to break the force of attraction between the particles of ice. So, that heat which is hidden inside the system which is used to break the force of attraction between the particles, it is called as latent heat. So, when it is with respect to melting of solid to get into the liquid state that heat we call it as latent heat of melting. When this heat energy is used to break the force of attraction between the water particles to change into vapor state that heat we call it as latent heat of vaporization. So ice melts at 0 degree centigrade and it boils at 100 degree centigrade. Water boils at 100 degree centigrade. These two temperatures are important. 0 degree melting of ice, 100 degree it's boiling of water. Now let us see what happens as we change pressure. 
with respect to the solids, liquids and gases, can we change their state by changing the pressure? Just now we have discussed that by changing the temperature, we can change the physical state of matter. Now, by changing the pressure, whether it's possible for us to change the state of matter. On changing the pressure means by increasing the pressure, what happens to the attraction between the particles of matter? Can you think of that? So, as you increase the pressure, particles will come closer, right? As soon as the particles come closer, the force of attraction between the particles will increase. So, we can change matter from one state to the other state. So, see here on applying pressure, the particles of matter can be brought close to one another and the state of matter can be changed. For example, if you consider carbon dioxide gas, you can convert it into solid form by increasing the pressure and lowering the temperature. Not only carbon dioxide in that matter, any gas, you can solidify it by applying pressure and lowering the temperature. Means applying pressure means you are going to increase pressure and you are going to lower the temperature. So this carbon dioxide in its solid form, so I write solid carbon dioxide, it is known as dry ice. Dry ice is nothing but it is solid carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide gas by increasing the pressure and lowering the temperature that can be converted into solid form. It's known as dry ice or solid carbon dioxide. Next important phenomenon we are going to discuss is evaporation. It's the phenomenon of changing of a liquid into its vapor state. Now this change is taking place at a temperature below its boiling point. Evaporation is a phenomenon or it's a process where a liquid is getting converted into vapor but this is happening at a temperature less than that of the boiling point of the liquid and this evaporation process is a surface phenomenon. If you could recall we have studied about vaporization What is vaporization? It's a phenomenon where liquid is getting converted into its vapor state, right? But this change from liquid to vapor state was taking place at its boiling point, correct? Water is converted into water vapor at 100 degree centigrade. Say, you have a beaker and you have water in that. Water is taken in the beaker. Now you are going to heat it so that the temperature is going to rise for about 100 degrees centigrade. At 100 degrees centigrade, this water starts to boil, right? And then it goes to vapor state. At 100 degrees centigrade, water is getting converted into vapor state. At 100 degrees centigrade, all the water molecules or the particles of water that is present inside this beaker, from the top, from the middle, from the bottom of the beaker, it's changing its state from liquid state to vapor state. That is what we call it as vaporization or it is called as boiling. Now this is bulk phenomenon. Why it is bulk phenomenon? It is because water particles or molecules that is present at the surface, in the middle, in the bottom, in the corner, totally everywhere in the beaker is changing its state. But with respect to evaporation, if you place this beaker outside, you are not going to change its temperature by providing heat to it. If you keep it as such for one week, what's going to happen, you see that level of water is being decreased in this beaker. It's because water particle that's present on the surface layer, on the top layer, they are going to change its state from liquid to vapor state. So now this phenomenon is taking place at temperature less than the boiling point of the water. 
So this is the difference between vaporization as well as evaporation. Vaporization is taking place at the boiling point. Whereas evaporation takes place at a temperature less than the boiling point. Boiling or vaporization is a bulk phenomenon because the particles present everywhere can change its state. Whereas with respect to evaporation, it is only the surface particles that can change the state from liquid to vapor state. Now let us see what are the factors that can affect the evaporation. So the first factor is that surface area. Surface area can affect evaporation. So increase in surface area increases evaporation. Say for example, I have a container and I am placing some liquid on this for evaporation. So you can see that with respect to A and B, surface area of A is more and surface area of B is lesser. So we know that evaporation is a surface phenomenon means particles which is present on the surface is going to evaporate. So here you have more surface area means you have more particles at the surface level. Less surface area means lesser particles are available for evaporation. So we have more surface area means more particle can undergo evaporation. As a result, increase in surface area increases evaporation. Second point is increase in temperature. As temperature increases, evaporation increases. The third point you have to note here is about humidity. Humidity is the water content that is present in the atmosphere. So you can correlate now. Already more water is present in the atmosphere means that evaporation would be difficult. So it is decrease in humidity increases rate of evaporation. More is the humidity means evaporation will be slow. Lesser is the humidity more will be the evaporation. Another factor that affects evaporation is wind speed. More speed of wind more will be the evaporation. It means that as wind speed increases more will be evaporation. As an example you can consider the process of drying of wet clothes. So when we place the wet clothes outside for drying. During that day, if the wind speed is more, in that case, our clothes will be dried at a faster rate. Similarly, when you have a humid atmosphere, you will also notice that the clothes that we put for drying will not be drying very fast. That process will be delayed. So basically, the process of drying our clothes is because of evaporation. The water that's present in the clothes will be converted into vapor state. When temperature is more, in that day, drying of our clothes will be faster. So this is how you can analyze how all these factors affect the rate of evaporation. It's important for you to note that evaporation produces cooling effect. For example, when acetone falls on our palm, we feel cool, right? You might have observed this. Now, why this is happening? It's because when acetone falls on our palm, Acetone absorbs heat energy from our skin and it's getting converted into its vapor state. As a result, our palm feels cool. Another example is that we are advised to wear cotton clothes during summer. It's because cotton is good absorber of water. As a result, it helps to absorb sweat and when this sweat is brought into contact with the surrounding atmosphere, it helps in the easy evaporation of the sweat and that cotton cloth helps us to keep cool during the summer days. Here in this table, I have listed a few units of some measurable quantities. So the base quantity that we have is length L. It is represented by the symbol L. Its unit is meter represented by M that is small letter English alphabet M. Then we have mass which is represented by the symbol small letter M. Its unit is kg. Time is represented by T. Its unit is S. So this is small letter English alphabet S that is used to represent seconds. Then we have its temperature that is represented by capital letter T. And the units that we usually use is Celsius and Kelvin. So Celsius is represented as degree C, okay, capital letter C, that degree centigrade is Celsius. Then we have the other unit is Kelvin. So this Kelvin is the SI unit of temperature 
and Kelvin is degree centigrade plus 273. Also, we use electric current. It's represented by capital I and the unit is ampere. Here, the unit of length meter is also SI unit. Kg is also SI unit. Seconds is also the SI unit and the unit of current is also the SI unit. Similarly, unit of pressure. Pressure is represented by the capital letter P and its unit is atmosphere. Also, it is represented in the units of Pascals. If you could recall, we have studied about diffusion process, right? It is the phenomenon of intermixing of particles of different states of matter. Also, I have told you that diffusion in case of solid is least. Liquid is intermediate and that of gases, diffusion is very faster. You might have observed this that the smell of hot food reaches us faster. Whereas to get the smell of cold food, we have to go near to it. Can you think of why this is happening? While we get the smell of food, it is because of the diffusion process, right? The particles of food are mixed with air that is present around us. So means they are mixing with one another by themselves. So this process is diffusion. Also, I told you that as temperature increases, Diffusion increases. So now for hot food particles, since the temperature is more, they can travel a long distance. So the smell of hot food reaches us. Whereas to get the smell of cold food, we have to go near it. Because cold food temperature is lesser, particles cannot travel a long distance. So the smell is present only region near to that. So we have to go near a cold food to get smell of it whereas the smell of hot food reaches us it's because of the diffusion of the particles so since the temperature is more these particles can diffuse through a long distance so similarly another example is the burning of incense sticks so we get the smell of these sticks it is because of diffusion of the particles because of the higher temperature so here you have test yourself questions Answer these questions in the comment section below this video. Question 1 is the process in which solid is directly converted into vapor state is called. Option A condensation, option B sublimation, option C solidification, option D vaporization. Second question, which of the following phenomena would increase on rising temperature? Option A diffusion, evaporation, compression of gases. Option B, evaporation, compression of gases, solubility. Option C, evaporation, diffusion, expansion of gases. Option D, evaporation, solubility, diffusion, compression of gases. Question number 3, which of the following conditions is most favorable for converting gas into liquid? Option A, low pressure, high temperature. Option B, low pressure, low temperature. Option C, high pressure, low temperature. Option D, high pressure, high temperature. Question number 4, dry ice means Option A, solid carbon dioxide. Option B, liquid carbon dioxide. Option C, calcium oxide. Option D, magnesium oxide. Question number 5, latent heat of vaporization is used to overcome the force of attraction between liquid particles at the boiling point. Option B, overcome the forces of attraction between the solid particles at the freezing point. Option C, increases the kinetic energy of the particles in the liquid state. Option D, increases the kinetic energy of the particles in the vapor phase. Last question, question number 6, which of the following has highest kinetic energy? Option A, particles of ice at 0 degree centigrade. Option B, particles of water at 0 degree centigrade. Option C, particles of water at 100 degree centigrade and option D, particles of steam at 100 degree centigrade. I forgot to include a point when I discuss the important points that you need to remember. Now, in some cases, you might be asked, what is the state of water at a particular temperature? Say, for example, at 0 degree centigrade. 
at 0 degree centigrade it is the freezing point of ice or it is the melting point of ice so at this stage water is present in solid and liquid state and at a temperature t is equal to 0 at a temperature t less than 0 degree centigrade water is present only in the solid state so because at 0 degree centigrade the ice is about to melt means it is melting so it's present in solid state as well as in the liquid state now when temperature is 100 degree centigrade that is the boiling point at this stage water is present in liquid state as well as vapor state it's because at 100 degree centigrade it starts boiling means liquid is getting converted into vapor state so both states are present for water and at temperature between 0 degree to 100 degree centigrade it's neither 0 nor 100 in between that water is present only in the liquid state and at a temperature more than 100 degree centigrade water is present in its vapor state so now if I tell at 25 degree centigrade what is this physical state of water so at 25 degree centigrade now it is between the melting point as well as boiling point so that is present in the liquid state so answer to this question is it is present in the liquid state so this is for water similarly for other liquids temperatures between the melting point as well as boiling point it's present in the liquid state temperature above the boiling point the given substance is present in its vapor state or its gaseous state temperature below the melting point that substance is present in the solid state so at the melting point both solid as well as liquid state is present at the boiling point both liquid as well as gaseous state is present if you find this video useful kindly share this video among your friends like and subscribe to our channel i'll meet you in my next video with another chapter thank you for watching stay connected keep learning take care bye bye